All right, hello everyone, and welcome to another webinar of Indosoft webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about the connectivity between Indosoft Web Studio and Indosoft products to the Wonder Historian database. It's going to be a very interesting uh, webinar. We're going to have live demonstrations of this connection happening. We're going to explain the technology behind that. And uh, the agenda for today's webinar is going to be this. I'm going to present a quick overview about Indusoft as a company. I'm going to talk about the uh, possibilities for the database connectivity using Indusoft Web Studio, how the integration with Wonder Historian is happening, uh, the connection to Wonder System platform. I'm going to talk about the native interface that we are developing for the Historian using the toolkit for Historian. And then you're going to go to a live demo. But before that, I'm going to present our very Special guest, Mr. Ray Norman, is uh, he's a specialist on uh, of historian on the Wonder side. So he's going to explain a little bit what is a historian, why do you need one. He's going to explain the differences between having uh, just a SQL Server database uh, instead of having a dedicated database. What type of data that we want when we are on industrial environment? What type of data that we want to store? And then Nor uh, Ray is going to show what uh, the advantages are of using a historian database, a wonder historian database, instead of using the traditional uh, SQL relational databases. I'm going to talk about the uh, an overview about the historian and then the client option that you have to connect to that historian uh, database and a quick summary. And then you're going to go to the live demo showing this connectivity happening. All right, so a quick company overview about Indusoft. So we were established here in the United States in 1997. That's where our headquarters are. And since September 2013, we are part of the Invences group. As you guys know, Invences is becoming Schneider as well. So Indusoft has been the pioneer in the industry of developing the first complete HMI SCADA package for Windows Embedded System, more precisely for Windows CE. Uh, we did that back in 1997, so Windows CE was version 1. And uh, we had a product running on commercial devices, on uh, industrial devices, since 1999. So we are the very first one to have a complete solution for that. And this is how actually our relationship with events started. As you guys may know, uh, or some of you guys may not know, but this relationship goes back eight years when we were working with Wonderware to get a uh, runtime for Windows C for that. We do have a web solution that works include, that works also on the uh, embedded environment. That means you can be running your Indosoft application on a Windows CE device and configure a web server, and you can go to a browser and see the pages that are running on the Windows CE device. That's a you know a very interesting approach. We have uh, we were the very first one to have anything like this. We do hold a patent for database connectivity. You can see here on the screenshot the patent that we have. And that's part of our solution to connecting the Indusoft Web Studio with the Wonder Historian. And uh, we already have support for multi-touch and HTML5 integration. Some of you guys that be using the latest version may have already noticed that. And our multi-touch works also on Windows CE as long as the hardware supports multi-touch. Here you can see some of our certifications. We've been certified by the OPC Foundation for our OPC clients, both OPC UA and OPC DA. We are an ISO 9001 uh, reserve firm. We, you know, powered by Windows Embedded. We are a gold partner for Microsoft, you know, for uh, over 10 years now. And uh, other certifications like Motorola and AT&T. And here are some of the awards that we've been getting throughout the years. We are showing the control engineering, only the ones that came after 2010. And you know, there is room here for more. Uh, as long as you guys read control engineering and vote for us, we're gonna keep doing that. So it's very interesting how we got those prizes. Again, the readers of uh, control engineers, they are the ones who vote, and uh, that's how we got all these prizes here. And some of the Frost and Sullivan awards that we've been getting. So. Uh, if you voted for us, I thank you guys for doing this. But this shows that we are doing something right because you know people are voting for us. So uh, as an introduction for this webinar, I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit the uh, interface that we have for the database connectivity. So 
What we allow you to have is any device running any version of Windows running a runtime of Windows Software Web Studio. So this can be a Panel PC running Windows CE 5, Windows CE 6, or could be a headless device like this one here running embedded, running CE, running any version of Windows. And through our gateway, we can connect to any relational database. So this can be Oracle, this can be SQL Server. I put here 2008, but it goes to 2012 as well. Go to any version of MySQL. And now, also, to the historian, that's what's coming up on our search stack 3 for the version 7.1. That's what's coming out. We do this through standard technologies, ADO, ADO.net, ODDB, and if needed, even ODBC. And, uh, you know, there's already ODDB uh, provided for a historian, but what we are doing is something more native to that connection, more elegant, if I may say that. But, you know, you can go to any relational database, so let's go to MySQL, uh, SQL, and we do have mutual redundancy that can be either full redundancy or historian forward embedded on the product. When we do the live, then you're going to see how simple it is to configure those things. And uh, having the power of saving this data to any of this relational database associated with the rich graphics that we offer with InnoSoft Web Studio, this allows you to create a very uh, solid connection to the ERP systems. So as you can see here, we've been uh, incredibly used, uh, more people use more and more HMI software to create uh, OEE applications, KPI applications, and those screenshots that you see here, those are screenshots of real applications uh, in the soft projects doing KPI analysis and OEE. We do have a template that we call the BI dashboard that you can uh, buy and configure it to your project, and that's pretty much how it looks like. These are some of uh, the screenshots of it. So uh, in just a few steps, you can connect to your database Say this column has the alarms, other column has other information. We do the calculations, and you're going to have this uh, ready for you as the BI dashboard. This is, you know, thanks to the solid tool that we have for connecting to databases. So, how we are doing the integration with uh, WonderWare System Platform, you know, that's where the history will be running. So, you're going to be running the software student, any Windows runtime again, and the data. Right now, you can already connect System Platform to uh, in Software Web Studio. We're going to show how this already happens. So we are uh, we are like System Platform is pulling the data out of InnoSoft, bring it to uh, to its Galaxy, and from there, you know, you can use that on Historian and save a huge amount of data as much as you want. All right, so we do get there the online and the history data. What we are implementing now is the capability of retrieving the data from the historian that we have already saved and displaying that on our trend chart. So that's the existing solution that we already have. So if you recognize this uh, screenshot here, this is on the Orchestra software on system platform, and you're going to configure a uh, DAS panel driver connecting to Indusoft tags, so then you're going to be pulling the data from Web Studio. we send the data out, and that data is recorded on the historian. And what we have coming up now on our Search Pack 3 for version 7.1 is this interface here, where if you're familiar with Web Studio and you have recognized this trend worksheet here, on well, the history formats, we currently have proprietary and database, and now we are introducing the new Wonderate Historian option here. All right, so having said that, I'm going to pass the presentation now to our very special guest, Mr. Ray Norman from Wonder. He's a system consultant, and he's going to take from now and talk to you guys about Historian, about the clients, and a quick summary, and then we're going to go back to the live demo. All right, so hold on. Well, good afternoon, Andre. Thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak to you all. Um, as an 18-year employee of Wonderware, the Wonderware Historian has probably been one of my favorite products to support. It came out uh, about 16 years ago, and um, it first came out with the name of Industrial SQL, and the client tools were Active Factory. So if you hear me say in SQL or Active Factory, um, that's actually the, the original names of the Wonderware Historian and Historian clients. <clears throat> We changed the names of them about five years ago to make it easier for our customers to understand what we were talking about, uh, a capability, instead of just a product name. 
So I'd like to go over a little bit about Historian and uh, uh, the actual Wonderwear Historian, Historian clients, and we'll also go into some classic methodologies of uh, talking to Indusoft. Um, as Andre mentioned, we've had a long relationship with Indusoft because our InTouch uh, Compact Edition um, actually uses the Indusoft runtime and has for the last eight years. So consequently, we've had uh, quite a, a nice long relationship with Indusoft, and it's nice to see them a, a sister company to us. So what is a historian and what do you really need it for? Well, first it's a repository, a storage repository for time series information. But it's a lot more than just a database. It stores your process data. It lets you retrieve your process data, but retrieve your process data in a form that makes it sensible. That is, you want to transform much of that information into, uh, much of that data into information. That information then can be used to make decisions. And one of the unique capabilities of the Wonderware Historian is the fact that its storage is separate from its retrieval. And so the resolution of storage can be radically different from the resolution of retrieval. And so we say with Wonderware Historian, store the data at the resolution of your process, but retrieve it at the resolution of the problem you're trying to solve. And we'll get into some of those details of what the retrieval side of the Wonderware Historian looks like in just a bit. But what is a historian? Well, it's actually a gold mine. In a historian, it's a gold mine of information of what's going on in your process, the efficiencies in your process, the inefficiencies in your process, and you can use that information to make your processes better. Well, how come I just don't use a database for that? Because actually, Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle really can handle the incredible volumes of data coming from a plant, but it really doesn't deal with time series data all that well because databases are transaction-based. They were originally designed for um, um, uh, systems where uh, it was a, uh, accounting for people and uh, accounting systems, and it was really designed for transactional data. An example of transactional data is if I go and uh, get $100 out of my account, <clears throat> the fact that I got $100 out of my account is the important information. The fact that I did it at 10.23 and 13 seconds this morning is just interesting information. But with time series data, the time stamp that something occurred is equally as important as the value. And so consequently, with databases, the storage and retrieval of that information is not exactly straightforward. And as I mentioned earlier, plants generate huge quantities of data. And that sheer quantity of data is a problem. So imagine a plant with just a thousand data points to be stored every second. Well, every point needs to have stored its value, its timestamp, and its quality, its OPC quality. And um, if I do that, and I do the calculations, it's about 300 gigabytes of raw data. And with the overheads and the indexes and such, um, that could be up to 15 terabytes uh, just from a simple thousand tag um, uh, uh, historian using regular relational databases. And this is kind of a small data, uh, a small example. Wonderware Historian uh, goes up in size from a little 32-tag uh, historian to a 2-million-tag historian. And you can imagine um, the data requirements if all 2 million tags were in row-column form. There's another problem with relational databases and the retrieval of um, time series information from a relational database. Because the time is a key variable, um, the only way that I can relate different values in time is if they have the same time stamp. Record them on a trigger, record them on a particular time, and so I then have what's called a wide format for the data. And in this particular case, here the information is being stored as it changes, but only at uh, item 21 are they all the same with the same time stamp. And the problem with relational databases is they can't interpolate time. Also, all data is treated equally, and so the data quality is not factored into, say, aggregate calculations. There's no time waiting for aggregate calculations as well, like a, um, an average. Uh, I may not want a statistical average. I may want a time-weighted average. And also, the min-max calculations for a relational database don't return the timestamp that was a minimum or the timestamp, it was a maximum. And so consequently, time is a problem with relational databases. 
And so a standard database is really good at answering uh, record type questions. Uh, how much do we produce? Um, uh, who was on shift? Uh, how much does customer spend last year? But it's not good at answering time-based questions. How long was this motor running? Um, how many times did we, did we exceed a particular stack opacity? Um, what was the longest time that we exceeded a water quality, um, let's say, uh, uh, 1.3 NTU? And so consequently, a historian is designed to answer these types of questions, where a relational database is not designed to answer those type of time-based questions. So a solution is one where historian. We store analog, string, and Boolean data at full resolution, but there's also additional options for data reduction with optional swing door, time, and value deadbands for analogs. We use standard Microsoft SQL Transact SQL to retrieve that information with extensions specifically for time series uh, data. An example would be a cyclic retrieval, that is, ret uh, retrieve the data as if it were stored once a second, or every 500 milliseconds, or every 50 milliseconds. Delta, return the data as it changes, full. Return the data as it was stored, exactly as it was stored. Additional um, uh, aggregate uh, calculations, average, min, max, time at min, time at max, integral uh, to discrete, we'll talk about some of those. And then discrete aggregate transformations, where I can take a motor and uh, calculate its runtime, calculate the number of times that it started or stopped, what was the longest time it was running, what was the shortest time it was running. And the idea is to turn the data that's in the historian into actionable information. So why the Wonderware Historian? Well, we've sold over 70,000 historians in the last 16 years. It's one of the most popular historians on the market. And we actually created a market for the console historian or the plant historian. Um, historians in our space that are competition are people like uh, Pi, uh, which makes a very good historian. Uh, Aspen 21, they also make a good historian. But um, one of the benefits of the Wonderware Historian is that it's so darn easy to use. Uh, for the most part, uh, instrument mechanics and electricians are the ones doing the administration of the Wonderware Historian. It's fast installation. Uh, it's checkbox configuration from uh, application server. There's tag importer for uh, HMI applications. There's also uh, comma separated variable and SQL bulk load ca uh, capabilities for uh, database configuration. But most importantly, the historian automatically store, uh, manages its storage. There's um, several different subdirectories, the circular, alternate, buffer, and permanent. And it takes care of managing um, the historic data by itself. And so consequently, it's one of those fire and forget capabilities that we have for years of data online. And it pr provides the, the platform for a complete plant performance solution. And if we look at the performance payback of historian applications, uh, really the payback of all uh, enterprise manufacturing information, um, they are often very, very fast in payback. And in many cases with the Wonderware historian, we've seen customers uh, pay back their historian investment in as few as a month to two months. All right, so an overview of the Wonderware historian itself. So what we do is um, collect data, um, store that data, and then retrieve that data and deliver it to users, to information users in different forms using the historian client tools. We do use Microsoft SQL Server, but we don't store the data in row column form. We use a capability of Microsoft SQL Server called object linking and embedding for databases. Now, when Microsoft originally came out with their SQL Server, it actually had a Sybase core. And Sybase um, treated data not of its own database, just as if it were its own data through a process called Open Data Sources, or ODS. When Microsoft then built the SQL Server uh, off of that core, uh, with, uh, starting with SQL Server 7.0, they introduced a new layer called Object Linking and Embedding for Databases. Microsoft wrote an OLEDB interface um, for, um, uh, of course, SQL Server, for Oracle, for Excel, for CSVs, for Access, and when Wonderware wrote the OLEDB interface to extract the data from our history blocks. So what we do is we take the data from um, uh, PLCs and RTUs and uh, HMIs, and via the Wonderware Historian core, store that data in a compressed format in subdirectories. By default, every day as a separate subdirectory. 
So consequently, when you're uh, backing up your historic data, you're not backing up a database. You're backing up just a subdirectory. When the client then wants to extract that information, they use structured query language to extract that, and it uses OLADB as the interface. So in the data acquisition, um, we need flexibility in storage. That is, we need to be able to store it in full resolution. And then, if necessary, reduce the amount of data that can be stored, that needs to be stored, with time or value dead bands. Or an algorithm called swinging door, which is a um, second derivative, which is looking at a rate of change um, uh, of change, and, uh, and then compress that for efficiency. The data sources could be anything with a two or three or four letter acronym from PLC, DCS, RTU, using a myriad of different capabilities, including CAPI, Structured Query, Excel, uh, Structured Query Language itself, uh, and of course uh, interfaces via uh, OPC. Then in the retrieval, we use that OLEDB provider to grab that information out of the uh, history blocks, the file folders, and then return it to the user using Structured Query Language. Now, structured query language, as I mentioned earlier, can have a problem with standard relational databases. And here's really the secret of the Wonderware historian. Let's assume I have data points that were stored every five minutes, 12, 12.05, um, 12.10. But let's say I wanted to retrieve the data as if it were stored at 12.02. Use a, using a standard relational database, I would get returned a null record set because there's no data stored at that time. And what the Wonderware historian does is it takes the last stored value, wherever that is in time, and interpolates time and brings that value and returns that last stored value as the last as the value. Now it can do it in both a stair step form as well as an interpolated form. For those of us who are data junkies, uh, as, as I consider myself, I only want the data return that actually was valid data, the last stored value. But for different interfaces, it's sometimes more appropriate to return the interpolated value that's interpolated both in value as well as time. And both of them can be used in, uh, in trends, both within the Wonderware uh, historian client tools as also within uh, the Indusoft uh, trend itself. One of the more important things that we can do with the Wonderware Historian is aggregate a discrete. And why would you think that would be important? Well, really, this is maintenance information. The number of times a valve opened or closed or the number of times a pump started or motor started uh, is very valuable maintenance information. And so the measures that you can do with a discrete are time and state, the number of transitions to and from that state, the pulse width or duty cycle, uh, calculating the total time and state, the minimum and maximum time and state, the average or the percent time and state. This is very valuable information for both uh, maintenance as well as process information. An example, let's say I wanted to optimize the distance between um, boxes on a packaging line. Um, you could use this aggregation to, uh, to optimize that. Another methodology of using uh, discrete transformations is to treat analog as a discrete using a, uh, a switch in the where clause called to discrete, we can then uh, take an analog and turn it into a discrete. An example of this would be, let's say I have a stack capacity uh, above a certain amount, or I'm looking at uh, how many times did I exceed a water quality or water purity standard. And so in this report, the end of the report or monthly report, I could say, well, uh, we exceeded opacity for a grand total of five minutes. Um, there were four times that uh, we exceeded that. The longest time was uh, 30 seconds, and the shortest time was 10 seconds. And so with this capability of taking an analog, turning it into a discrete, and then using these transformations to turn that data into information, it means that I can t make sense of that data that's contained in that historian. So some of the retrieval modes and state calculations that are all uh, capable with the Wonderware historian are the value state, min, max, average, total, percent, min, max, average, contained, and the round trip, min, max, average, total, and percent contained. Additional retrieval nodes for analogs, uh, specifically for this time series data, would be integral or time-weighted average or interpolated, rate of change, uh, best fit. 
An example of a best fit would be, let's say I'm doing a trend over a three or four month period. Well, I could do a cyclic retrieval since I only have, let's say, 1,024 pixels or uh, 1,900 pixels across the stream. I could do a cyclic retrieval uh, of row count, a row based, where I get, uh, let's say, 1,900 evenly spaced values over my two month period, but I could possibly miss some maximas and minimas. And the best fit was designed for that trend, so it takes that trend and it breaks it into, uh, say, 5 or 10 or 15 pixel elements. And then when each of those sub-elements or those sub-times bring back the beginning value, the end value, the max value, and the min value, and the first exception. So consequently, even if I'm doing a one-month, two-month, three-month, or six-month trend, I'm seeing all the, the noise or the maximas and the minimas, and I'm not missing anything. And that's done specifically for uh, trend type information. I mentioned earlier that um, time and state could also be done uh, used against not just discretes, but analog and also string. And where would I use that? Well, let's say I wanted to make a poor man's downtime tracking system. If I am capturing um, the state information of a string, running, stopped, um, uh, e-stopped, um, all of those are states that then can be turned into what was the total time, what was the min time, the max time. The same with an analog with values of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's say they're fault codes from a PLC or fault codes from a, uh, a variable frequency drive. Those also could be done as uh, uh, time and state retrieval methods for uh, those capabilities. Retrieval filtering, sigma, analog to discrete, snap to, are then to take data and um, massage it because as much as we would like all of our data going into the historian to be pristine, often it's not. And so as we're doing reporting, we want our reports to be as accurate as possible. And so consequently, there's also filtering that can, recur that can occur on the data retrieval to help with reporting. With Historian 10.0, nigh on five years ago, we also introduced tiered historian capability. And um, the uh, um, Indusoft uh, Web Studio in the version Service Pack 3 that uh, uh, Andre is going to be talking about later is actually using some of this technology uh, in the toolkit. And uh, he'll talk about that uh, at the end of my presentation. But one of the capabilities of a tiered historian is to take multiple smaller historians and take their information and replicate that to a more centralized historian. At the same time of that simple replication, we could also do summary replication and summary calculation of analog or uh, state summary on different periods, let's say a five minute or 15 minute period, and also send that data to the tier two. When we're doing that, we're using Windows Communication Foundation um, as a transport, and it's a single TCP IP port of the user's uh, choice. And so consequently, not only is it uh, uh, firewall friendly, it's also bandwidth friendly because the amount of information that's being passed across that channel is uh, appropriate for wide area networks. One of the things that can be done with that analog summary history is actually stored as a record set in the history block. And it's kind of hard to see it, so I'll bring it back. So with analog summary history, you can create different schedules. By default, there's a one minute schedule, a five minute schedule, 15, 30 minutes, one hour, and one day schedules. You can create additional schedules of your own. And then the underlying subsystem will automatically create the summary history. And what it does is it, in the uh, summary record set, it gives back the beginning value of the period and its timestamp, the end value of the period and its timestamp, the max value timestamp, minimum value timestamp, the percent good samples within that period, um, the average, the standard deviation, and the integral. Now an integral typically is just used for flows or rates to do a totalization. But if you integrate, let's say, a temperature over time, you get an interesting value. And it's actually an energy density type of value. So if I were to integrate a temperature over a period, let's say uh, integrate a temperature over a batch, if I can look at that from batch to batch to batch, one of the things that I get is the energy that was put in to that batch by integrating the temperature. And so it's a really interesting view of looking at uh, data when we can do these additional summary calculations.
in the state summary, uh, just like with the um, uh, analog summary, the state summary can be um, pulled against discrete data, analog data, and string data, and it gives you the full characterization of that discrete. Um, how many times was it true? <coughs> Excuse me. How many times it was false? The total time was true. The total time was false. The max time was true. The minimum time was true. And the same with false. So all of the uh, uh, the characterizations of that. And as I mentioned earlier, that's this is manufacturing or maintenance type data against your production information. The Wonderware Historian comes in many different sizes. Um, we ship Microsoft SQL Server with uh, just about all of our products. We're actually Microsoft's second largest distributor of Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, SAP is the largest, and uh, uh, Wonderware, um, Invensys Wonderware is the second largest uh, distributor of Microsoft SQL Server. So the sizes go from uh, little 32 tag historians all the way up to 2 million tag historians. And um, the entry-level historian, or the 32-tag historian, uh, does not require uh, any licensing at all. It is limited to seven days of retrieval, uh, although the storage is not. It's just a retrieval limitation. Um, there's also a companion 25,000-tag seven-day historian that's also very low cost, and it's designed to be as a Tier 1 historian feeding a Tier 2. But uh, um, the whole purpose of this is to get people using historian, make it easy to use, and um, uh, for a lot of operations, this is uh, perfectly adequate. So historian clients. When we first released Industrial SQL, the Wonderware Historian, 16 years ago, I thought everybody would like to learn a little structured query language. And I was wrong. Um, our customers want to know that we have a completely open interface to that information because the information or the data does belong to the end user but they don't want to learn another language to go uh, extract that information. And so consequently, through the use of historian clients, Active Factory, uh, you have a point-and-click interface to that information without having to write structured query language. But be aware that the structured query language is always there for you to use, and we do have many customers that don't use our clients at all, that do their own reporting and their own work um, in Perl or C++ or C Sharp or Active Server Pages, or anything that can execute structured query language. So really, the historian clients are the face of Wonderware bringing that plant information to life. So what can you do with those historian clients? Well, you can explore your information and data. And this is what people normally do when they get started using the historian. They use Trend, and they use Query, and the Excel add-in to explore that information and find relationships. As they do that, they start analyzing the information and analyzing what's going on in their plant and processes and discover those um, inefficiencies or efficiencies, what's working right, and then communicate that to other people via reporting. Once those reports are run, they want to be able to distribute that to more and more people, and so then they publish that to the information server reporting website. There's a whole host of out-of-the-box functionality that comes with um, the historian client tools. And there's really just three easy steps. Uh, install Wonderware Historian, uh, assuming that uh, Microsoft Office is also installed. Install the Historian Client. Install the Information Server. And you have a complete plant production reporting environment. For the desktop, the desktop tools, Historian Client uh, Trend and Historian Client Query are probably two of the uh, more common uh, desktop tools. And then through Microsoft integration, the Historian Client Workbook, which is an XLA or Excel add-in for Excel, and Historian Client Report for Word. All of these tools are available on your desktop. Trend is an amazingly full-featured trend. Um, we get, uh, much like Microsoft, when Microsoft gets enhancement requests to um, Excel or to Word, they find that the uh, capability has already been put in the product. With um, Wonderware Trend, we find that a lot of enhancement requests that we have for Wonderware Trend, we actually have those enhancements already in. So it's an amazingly full-featured uh, trend, tool, trend tool. What's interesting about the trend, it actually exists as its uh, origin as a .NET control. And um, we have an ActiveX wrapper, for, so we also distribute it as an ActiveX for those uh, HMIs that can have an ActiveX. It's also available as an executable. 
but they're all using the same core .NET controls uh, behind the scenes. With the trend, each trend that I show here, these are individual trends, each trend can have up to 255 pens. The workspace itself, I can have up to 50 workspaces, uh, 50 trends in each workspace. So consequently, if you can handle uh, and understand uh, 50 individual trends, each with 255 pens, have a good time. Many of these trends can also be set up as X, Y plots, because sometimes not always do I want uh, a value versus time. These little dots here, asterisks, are um, looking at uh, string values that are brought back in history. And another capability that you have with the trend is to annotate the trends. And those annotations are stored in the historian so that whenever I look at that tag at that time, I look at the annotation for that trend. Query is the tool that I actually used um, when I first came to Wonderware to help teach me structured query language. And so it's a point and click interface that allows me all the different retrieval, different methodologies that I can do with uh, Wonderware historian data and then the SQL that's actually uh, prepared for that. And uh, that SQL then can be copied and pasted into any tool that can execute the structured query language and run it from there. But it's also a handy tool for just doing ad hoc analysis and ad hoc queries against the Wonderware historian. Report is, an, is a, the word add-in. And report um, actually uses um, that trend or that query tool to embed the queries within, uh, within Word. We find most customers just use um, the Excel add-in workbook because that's a more um, appropriate environment for a lot of reporting purposes. And no knowledge of structured query language is required. Where if I look at um, the Word add-in report, some excuse me, structured query language uh, knowledge is required. Workbook, it's a pure point and click interface for going and pulling data from the historian and then using the formatting capabilities of just standard Microsoft Excel for the reporting. Another ActiveX that ships with historian client tools is the single value entry ActiveX. You can always insert data into the historian via the standard methodologies of um, historian client, or pardon me, um, uh, the uh, IDAS or in SQL data acquisition services layer, the MDAS layers, uh, the native interfaces. But you can also do SQL inserts into history, just a direct uh, SQL query. And what the single value entry does is it uh, uh, automates that so I don't need to know structured query language but allows me to manually enter data into the historian from uh, any uh, HMI that can handle ActiveX. The Information Server Reporting website is the um, Active Factory Reporting web for taking those reports, the uh, Excel add-in reports, the queries, the trends, and then publishing them to a reporting website. So consequently, I take the desktop applications of Workbook, and I publish that to a reporting website. I can see it in a browser. The same with trend, query, and uh, report and query. And so all of those um, using the um, uh, information server reporting website can be reported against that. So the content that we can uh, publish with um, a reporting website is first the workbook. There is a click and publish um, a button um, in Excel for uh, publishing that report, both as a static report, meaning um, um, don't make any changes to it. Um, uh, save as HTML and just uh, um, uh, look at the HTML. An on-demand report, which actually runs the report in the background and then displays the results. And scheduled reports, um, put them on a particular schedule, um, daily, weekly, monthly, um, uh, every 15 minutes or whatever. The same with trend. I can click and publish trends uh, to uh, information server. And query, um, reporting website will run those saved SQL queries. There's also a set of uh, ASP reports that are built in uh, for uh, standard reports. And then, of course, Microsoft SQL reporting services are part of Information Server for those people that want uh, the capability and power of Microsoft SQL Server reporting services. So the methodology for sending uh, Excel reports to uh, Information Server is uh, really just hit the uh, historian tab and say, I want to publish that report. And then it says, uh, well, what do you want to uh, publish that as? A uh, on-demand report, a static report, or a scheduled report? 
And uh, the on-demand reports, it uh, um, runs the report um, uh, when you want it to. And we actually use a trick of Microsoft Excel. A lot of people don't realize it, but Excel can be run as a service in the background. And so what we do when we actually run a on-demand report or a uh, scheduled report, scheduled report um, the reporting website launches Excel as a service. It opens up the uh, particular report to run, the XLS. It runs the report, and it saves the result as HTML, one of the capabilities that is actually in uh, native capability in Microsoft Excel. And then we just render the HTML. So it's uh, actually a Microsoft trick that we're using in the background. So the static and on-demand reports, uh, static report is uh, um, just that. It's just the information without uh, uh, any intelligence. It's just the results. Um, on-demand reports, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, are just run uh, on-demand um, from the website. And uh, so those take, uh, can take um, uh, a few seconds or, or more to run depending upon their complexity. Static report is just uh, the report itself um, uh, saved off. There's built-in analysis reports, current value, discrete time and state, event snapshot, annotation, warm history reports. And, um, um, and that really concludes the, uh, the main presentation. I uh, don't want to go too much time because uh, Andre has some uh, pretty, uh, pretty impressive little demo coming up. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the uh, native capabilities that we've had really for the last eight years of integrating uh, Web Studio information into uh, the Wonderware Historian. When Wonderware uh, released the uh, InTouch for Compact Panel, which uses um, um, Indusoft uh, as the runtime, we also released a DA server called the DAS Panel. And, um, and so it connects to uh, Indusoft Web Studio and um, uh, gives us our information. And we're going to use a connection in Historian called IDAS, and that stands for in SQL Data Acquisition Services. So this is a pull technology where it's going to request the data just like um, a client requests data from an OPC server. From Web Studio, we get the tag list from uh, the project tags and the, the data sheet view. And I just pasted those into um, the CSV form for loading data, uh, loading tag information into the historian. And so you can see here, I just pasted it into the tag name, I used the uh, tag name as the description, and then the item name uh, for that as well. And then um, with the historian, there's a capability of doing database configuration import and export. And so we just use the import capability of importing that into the historian. And uh, here's my uh, text file, my uh, uh, IWS load. And uh, it added 12 analog tags, you can see there, and set finish and committed that. And I have that data uh, available in the Wonderware Historian. If I go to a live mode, <clears throat> a few little things. I mentioned earlier the swinging door algorithm. Here's an example of the information that is stored using swinging door. Notice it's a much reduced data set from, um, let's say, this other analog where we're storing every value on change. But here with um, uh, the Web Studio, we then have uh, the data coming directly from IWS. And so if I wanted to add a new uh, value, new tag, I just do that in my trend. I could spend an entire hour just going over the capabilities of trend. But as I leave you, I wanted to do a last little um, demo of the query tool itself. So the capabilities uh, of the query tool, I'm just going to look at history values, and I'm going to look at um, uh, these items here. And here's the structured query language query that is um, built for looking at then the actual information itself. In the retrieval methodology, here are all those different retrieval modes that I mentioned earlier, cyclic, delta, full retrieval. Um, and uh, so if I wanted to retrieve data, say, every 10 seconds, I would just say I want to uh, retrieval every 10 seconds, then go ahead and run that. And um, uh, you can see as I change the, um, um, the value here, it just changes the where clause for that data retrieval. And so at this particular point, I'll go ahead and uh, turn uh, control back over to Andre, and uh, we'll go on with uh, the demos. All right, great. This was really amazing. Thank you very much for this very, very <laughs> interesting presentation. I 
I'm sure, you know, everybody really like that. And uh, so, you guys have seen the uh, existing connection that you can have from the orchestra system to the Eagle Soft tags. As he mentioned, it's been out there, you know, for quite some time right now. So, the live demo that I'm going to do now, I'm going to connect to one of my VMs here. I have a virtual machine that has the, the story installed. It has the DAS, uh, DAS panel, DAS panel configuration here. So uh, when we go to the configuration, you configure uh, the global parameters, the timeouts, the uh, pulling interval, things like this. So you add here a new topic. So you give the topic a name. You say which tags, which web studio tags you want to connect to the, uh, to the orchestra which by its time is going to be used on the uh, historian. And here are the other parameters, like the, the timeout and uh, the, the pulling time and things like this. And then you can go right now here. I'm running our PC demo. That's the one that I'm running here. So we connect when you go the diagnostics structure. It actually shows the tag values as I open here. that we are communicating. I need to configure one tag, so this one here shows uh, in red. Uh, the other ones, we have good values here. Those values all coming from the uh, Web Studio runtime. So if I go here on Web Studio and show the trend, so we have uh, some of these guys here. So I'm going to go and uh, bring, for instance, uh, another pin that's going to be uh, my pressure here. So here are the guys. So when I go ahead and show the, the historian trend, I'm actually showing you here a different tag, but uh, go back here. Those are the values that we are talking, you know, the trend cosine, on off, and things like this. That's what we have configured here on the Web Studio screen, on the trend screen. All right, so you can see here trend sign, cosine, so the trend sign is the level. You're going to have the same type of curve if I go here on the history and put those tags in there. So they're here on my list. So, uh, Here's, for instance, my trend sign is in there. And let me rescale that to fit, even though I'm not being able to, to make it fit right now. You're only looking at one uh, minute of data. There you That's go. Correct. That's correct. All right. Anyway, uh, so this is the existing configuration that we already have out there. So, uh, as uh, Ray mentioned, we are implementing a more elegant way. This way that you are doing here, the historian is pulling data from Web Studio and storing this data into the database. All right? So what we're going to do now, we're going to start pushing the data from Web Studio into the database and take the advantage of things like the built-in storing forward. So that's what's going to come on our upcoming Service Pack 3 on Web Studio. So if you're familiar with Web Studio, you may have already seen that when you're configuring the trend worksheet right here, you have the option to choose a proprietary format, a database, or a wonder historian. So let me just go back here to this computer where I have our current existing version. If I open here, right now I have two options. I have the option proprietary and database. So if I configure, uh, if I show here my uh, my configuration right now to MySQL, all I have to do, let's say I'm going to connect this, uh, this second trend worksheet here. Right now it goes for Pyatari. I want to have that guy go to the database. So I go to the database configuration. We can have a project before or I can go here and configure the database. So I'm going to go uh, SQL Server. And I'm going to go to the uh, SQL 2008 R2 that I have on this machine here. I can enter user and password, or I'm going to use the integrated. So here I'm showing the database that I already have there. So I'm going to use the test database. Click on test connection. So it is connected. So right now I already I have already configured to create this uh, table here called trend2. So let me connect to this uh, to the SQL database here real quick. So 
So, go back to the same database. Oops. Go to the Windows Authentication, the same one. And the database that I'm connecting to is this one here called Test. And uh, when you see the tables, right now we have only the, the, the table that's called Trend 1. And now I have configured this one here to create a table called Trend 2. So I'm going to save this guy. I'm going to save this guy. So when I call the runtime, we start our database gateway. And the database gateway is this little guy here. This is the one who makes it possible to have the connection between our runtimes and any relational database. So here I'm going to show on the log all the messages that are happening right now. I have no errors. So if I look here on my database, if I refresh my information here, so we have automatically created the trend two. So if I run a, uh, a select, there you go. You can see the data. You can see my timestamp here is uh, 1551. So if I go all the way down here, that's pretty much uh, current data that we have right here. All right? That's what we have. So this is how simple it is to connect in Software Studio to a relational database. And now we are adding something even more powerful than this. Other, uh, besides having the proprietary and database options, we're going to have now a third option here. So that's what we are showing here. This is the beta of the upcoming Service Pack 3 where I go and I have now the option for Wonder Historian. So it's a third option here. So I'm going to open one of the uh, worksheets that I have created already. So I have here connect to the Wonder Historian, one set called Real Tag Webinar. I have here other two that I call Real Tag and Real Tag 2. So all these guys, they are already available. So if I call here the trend, which is a client from the historian, I can already identify those three tags that we have created before. So those tags are already send their data to the historian database. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to go here, create something completely new so you can see how this configuration goes. So I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to have a tag here that I'm going to call real webinar PM, at least for me here in the United States, it is PM now. I'm going to create this tag as a real tag. There it is. I'm going to tell it to save. I'm going to first create a script, a quick script for this tag so I can simulate values to it. We can see the, the, the data coming. So I'm going to put here. This tag is going to receive a random value times 100. That's the tag that we are creating now. So I save my script here. And using our database file, we can see that this tag is already uh, simulating a few values. Actually, now you can see the values being simulated. All right. So when I go back here to my trend five, I'm going to say, OK, where I want this data to be saved. So that's where we're going to go here on the historian. And we're going to enter the information like where the historian is. On this presentation, it happens to be on the same computer. I'm using just one computer for uh, all this configuration here. So I have to enter the username, the password, and uh, if I'm going to do a story forward, I'm going to enter here the path where I'm going to be saving that data. As Ray mentioned, uh, instead of just uh, columns and uh, and rows, using historian to back it up, just back up the entire folder. So that's what we are preparing here. We have these other two fields, the status and load. So on this status, it retrieves uh, what's the current uh, connection, the status of the database, and reloads. We use this field, for instance. Uh, we can use, instead of hard code where the server is, we can have a tag here between 30 brackets, a string tag. And on my application, I can change or I can automatically load the location of my historical server. If I want to do that, I may need uh, it will not take place right away. It's going to take place as soon as I toggle the value of this reload trigger field here. Okay? So then I enter here the address where the Web Studio Gateway is running. This little fella here. 
that we were talking about. This is the guy that will create the bridge between the databases and the InnoSoft tags. So I'm going to have this gateway here, which is now prepared to connect to, uh, to Historian. I'm going to enter here the location, which, again, it happens to be on the same computer, but not necessarily has to be. And the TCP IP port number is 3997. So I'm going to do all that here. And I'm going to save this, guys. That's my worksheet number five. And let me take a look here on the gateway. So I'm already adding data to the tag, real tag webinar. So if I go here, look, all the tags here on the webinar, going to focus, we're going to read again. Oh, uh, let me see something here. And now let me start that. Okay, it is being simulated. So when I go to all the analog tags. I was expecting to see the tag in here, the real webinar. Unless I may have entered the invalid. Well, actually, I don't think so because here it says that I'm putting the data there. The real tag webinar. It says that it's going there. Quality good. Oh, I don't see the real webinar PM in here. All right, maybe my sorry configuration here is oh, say on tag change. That's what I needed to do. I think. All right. Adding data now. There you go. All right. That's what I need. I needed to have the save uh, on tag change here. So if I refresh my tags now, here we go. We have on the list the real webinar PM tag. So I can assign this tag here on my historian. So the historian client, the trend client, now has also the curve. So I'm going to change this guy here to to have a smart duration. Okay, we got one enough data. It's, you know, we are sending an average change, so it's a little bit difficult to identify because we are, you know, uh, going up and down with uh, r random values here. But that's pretty much all I had to do. So I configured here the tag, configured the historian, and then I had to check this box here to save a tag change. And now we are generating a huge, a massive amount of data on the historian. And that's why it's good to have a dedicated database like that one, because that type of database is capable of processing all this data. As Ray mentioned, if you may have a small plant with, let's say, a thousand points during one day, if you're saving every second, you know, a thousand times uh, over 8,000 points uh, or 8,000 uh, records per point, that you know, that can generate a lot of data. And to retrieve this using a relational database, that can be challenging. Retrieve one week of data or one month, even more. And using a dedicated database like what you have on Wonder Historian, that makes it all uh, much more feasible, much more possible. So, again, this is what's coming now. The Wonder Historian as the third option on the trend uh, worksheet. We're going to have the same thing also on the and uh, once you configure the tag here, when you're configuring the screens, so if I go here and open my trend screen, because I have the tag there, this guy here now is going to be able to, if I put here one of my tags that we that we configure now, so let's say the real tag uh, webinar PM, I just need to come here and enter 
a caller, a label to it, and where are we going to retrieve this data from? We're going to retrieve it directly from the historian, from the owner historian. Okay, this is the part that I'm not able to show it right now, but this is all you're going to have to do to configure when you when we release the package. All right. So with this, we have seen uh, what is coming and what is already out there. If you want to create this connection, and we're going to go to our Q and A session. Let me just hide this guy here. So now we are on the uh, Q&A session, questions and answers, and uh, you can submit your questions either through our Q&A panel or the, uh, or the chat, okay? Even though it may appear to you that you are the only one here, we have a lot of people on this webinar. We just don't disclose the name of the people that are attending to the webinar, all right? So uh, let me get here, some of the questions, depending on the questions, I may read out loud, or some of them, you know, I may just uh, reply to them privately. Okay, so please go ahead and submit your, submit your questions, both me and uh, and Ray here. We are here for you guys to answer them, okay? I already got one question here. I'm going to reply to it uh, privately. So uh, we got a question here, Ray. I'm not sure if you would be able to answer that. Uh, we have one one of the guys here asking about license terms and price list. I guess that that would depend on the geographic location to get the price list for that specific country or state. Yeah, and it would be through the local. It'd be through the local um, uh, Wonderware contact, Wonderware distributor. In uh, North America, we go through distribution. In Europe, we go through distribution. Um, in the rest of the world, it's direct uh, to Wonderware. But uh, um, on the uh, Wonderware.com website, there's a listing of your um, local resource. And uh, um, for the pricing, it uh, um, it goes from like I said, there's no charge for the 32 tag historian. Uh, to uh, close to a million dollars for the two million tag historian uh, and uh, uh, everything in between. The um, um, distributors uh, and, the, and the, the peddlers, as I call them, the salesmen, don't particularly like me talking about pricing, so I would defer to, uh, to them. Uh, since I'm a system consultant and not a salesman, uh, they don't like me talking pricing. Um, but uh, um, uh, those are the local uh, resources for, uh, for pricing for the Wonderware um, uh, historian and historian client tools. All right, thank you, thank you. I got an interesting question here. It's not doesn't seem to be related to this topic, which is the uh, integration between Web Studio and the historian, but it's more like a what further integrations planned between Indosoft and Wonderware in general. Well, since we are all now part of the same uh, family, you know, on the same group. There is more integration that's going to happen not only with Wonderware, but with all Inventus and now all Schneider products. So you may expect uh, everybody to be able to work together, you know, on a, on a very simple way. Uh, that means uh, us talking to the Triconics PLCs, uh, us integrating with uh, InTouch, exchanging data on a native way. And uh, so there are a lot of strategies still to be put in place, but what exactly uh, what further integration we're going to have, those are still under uh, we're studying, 
the best integration that can have, but there will be more integration between, you know, Indosoft and the other Inventus and Shiner products. Okay? I hope that answers your question. So we are open for more questions now. So, uh, for the existing, for the existing uh, solution that we have nowadays, if you want to do a uh, the, the, the existing connection, the DAS panel, if you go to our website in our daily blog, if I go here to Inglesoft.com, and then if you go here under, let it finish loading. So, marketing, corporate blog, and then you can look for our blog in English. Back in November, we wrote a blog about the integration with system platform. So, uh, here we are showing all the latest one. As you can see, we are very active. You know, almost every day we have a, a blog entry. So, let me take a look on the older posts. And I'm going to look on November. And I'm going to look... Another one, integrating in software Studio with Wanderer System Platform. So if you look on this blog here from November 20th, it shows the connection using the driver called Dex Panel, the uh, compact panel, the server, so it's the Dex Panel dot one, and even has the screenshots of how to configure that. All right, so this is already out there. It is already available. You guys can use, and on our upcoming so respect them, we're going to, uh, this is uh, what we may call the pooling concept, where the history is pulling data from Web Studio, and what we are introducing is using the toolkit, we are pushing the data from Web Studio into the historian, all right? So again, in our blog, you already have instructions on how to make that magic happen, all right? So uh, we got a question about a training video about uh, using Indusoft Web Studio, if I think. On our website, we have, if you go here under support, video library, you have videos about doing almost everything with Indusoft Web Studio. If you go to the full video library, and we have all the webinars that we did so far, examples, and even our full training class, we have that on video as well. So you can take advantage of that. And a, a training video about how to use the historian or how to integrate the web studio with the historian. A training video about that right now is uh, this webinar. This stuff that you know is coming out right now. Once it's uh, released, we're gonna do an official training on it. On it, but you have seen already on our blog, we already have instructions on how to make that happen. Okay, and uh, let's see. All right, I'm not sure if uh, if Yuri can answer that. Uh, if there's any training video for using the historian, any uh, thing that people can uh, be self-trained to use the historians? On the Wonderwear website for training, there's uh, web-based training for um, uh, many of our tools, and I believe there's um, web-based training for Wonderwear Historian on the uh, Wonderwear website. All right. Uh, they recently uh, posted a brand new um, uh, website, um, um, and uh, uh, quite frankly, <laughs> I can't find anything <laughs> on it anymore. <laughs> they just posted it on a Friday, and uh, I'm trying to uh, wade my way around it myself. And uh, but uh, under the training link, there should be uh, online training for uh, for Wonderware historian clients, um, uh, web-based training for that as well. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you. Dan, uh, we got some questions here. They're not exactly related to the topic. I would rather, uh, you know, uh, stay on the topic to reply to them. But since I'm seeing this uh, more than once, so everybody knows about uh, Indosoft becoming part of Invensys, and you know we are all becoming part of Schneider now. If that's going to affect any of the existing relationships that Indosoft has with any customers, no, everything remains exactly the same. The customers that like us, they're going to still be able to use everything that we do. You know, it doesn't matter what type of uh, agreement that we may have. Indosoft went to the market mostly through OEMs. We're going to still be partners with all the OEMs. You know, and now we have even more to offer. You know, because we have all the Products on a family. Okay, so on that point, everything remains pretty much the same. All right, uh, let's meet it for questions. For a few seconds, we don't see any other specific question coming right now. Okay, I guess this is it then. So I'm showing you here to you guys how you can contact Indusoft for specific uh, support questions. You can send your email to support at Indusoft.com. Any other questions, you know, you can send your info at Indusoft.com of any other local uh, email that we have. We have uh, our offices in Brazil, Germany, and USA. And here you see the email for each one of them. And now we're specific websites in uh, English, Portuguese, and in German. Our phone numbers, you can give us a call, uh, post your question about this topic or any other topic. This webinar has been recorded, so you can rewatch it and uh, see any point that uh, was more interesting to you that you want to see that again. Uh, it's going to be available on our video library in our website. And uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, we're going to send you guys who attend the webinar a uh, quick survey. If you respond to that survey, uh, it's going to help us making things better. And as a token of appreciation, we're going to send to you guys a thank you gift. It's going to be an Indusoft T-shirt from our webinar series. And uh, with that, I really thank each one of you and uh, a special Thanks to our special guest, Ray, for this great presentation, for you know taking the time and showing all those interesting things. And for all of you that stayed here for over an hour and uh, gave us the opportunity to present you this uh, new, exciting architecture that we are putting out on the market right now. Okay, so thank you, guys, and I hope to see you guys again on the next webinar. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, and thank you, Andre. Have a good day.